For all things outdoors, listen to the father of two, the Jesus-loving TV show hosting Harry, True Blood American Redneck, Ben Cole. And listen to the outdoor filming, chef cooking, chocolate milk drinking, John Weismuller. And we are Rooted Podcast. Hello, everybody. Thanks again for joining Rooted Podcast. We have a very detailed episode coming up today. So on the last episode, we kind of crossed over into this a little bit. We just gave y'all just a teeny tiny sample portion of what really goes into this topic today, which is food plots, which is nutrition for your deer herd. So we're going to really, really deep dive into this. And I think you guys are going to love it. So Ben, Ben is way more educated into this subject than I am. So you're probably going to hear a lot of the talking from him today, but regardless, we're going to dive into it. So Ben, let's kind of talk about a couple things we already discussed just to just to go over it one more time and then we'll really, really deep dive. So let's let's go into a soil sample for a food plot. More specifically, we're kind of talking these summer plots that we're coming into. So simply put, Ben, what is a soil sample? So a soil sample, it's it's pretty basic, is a test to see what nutrients are available in the soil for plants to use. And it gives you a number and you can then go in and calculate your fertilizer needs, lime needs, things of that nature. So that way you can provide those plants with everything that they need to grow and yield the highest yields. And gotcha. you, know, you may ask, well, how do you pull a soil sample? Well, there's a thousand different ways you can do it. The scientific approach to doing it is doing it on a grid, right? So you zigzag across the field based on how big the field is. And so what you're doing is you're pulling samples all the way across the field and there's different points all the way across. And that way you're covering all the different soil types in that particular field. Because one area might need more nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium than another. So it's really good to have a good combination of all the soil in that field a good representation of all of it because then you can base that number on you know what the field actually needs you know when you get those results back it's telling you the exact amount of what the field needs and if you have a good mix of all of it well then you're better suited for accommodating the high regions and the low regions it's just a much better uh, way to do it now there is another way to pull soil samples and you know depending on the size of the field obviously like if you're in a food plot you're not going to want to go and zigzag across a, a tiny little food plot right so what i would do is i'd start in the center grab one there and on the corners just so that way you know you have and i don't mean like right up in the corner in the woods i mean like you know 15 feet something yeah. like that off so you're still in the plot itself um, but just so you have a good coverage of the whole thing, you know, that's, that's kind of how I've always saw sampled and it's worked out really great. And it'll really help you when it gets to the time to do your fertilizer and lime application. Gotcha. So why, why do you think one should pull a soil sample if they are going to make a food plot? Like, is it just because it gives you all these numbers? Like what is, what does all that kind of tell somebody? Well, so. A soil sample, an analysis is what you're doing. So when you're pulling the sample, you're just grabbing samples of soil, right? And then you're putting it in a little baggie and writing what field it's from, yada, yada. And you ship it off to the lab. And what you're getting back is telling you, number one, pH. So your pH tells you how basic or acetic your soil is, right? And seven is in the middle, and that's neutral. So you, for the maximum growth of majority of the plants out there you're going to want a bare minimum of five five i recommend six zero, and you know it needs to range from five five to six five but you know like i said it all depends on the crop some crops like six zero to six five you know so you want to keep it in that range right there um, for the best growing abilities of that soil as far as ph goes now Another thing it's going to tell you is your N, P, and K requirements. Now, you may ask, well, what is N, P, and K? 
that would be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And those are your three main nutrients to grow plants. It's the food for the plants to grow in the soil. Now, there's also some macro, micro elements and things like that in the soil. But for the basis of, you know, making sure that it has everything that you need, because let's face it, we're not trying to grow a crop to harvest, right? We're trying to grow a crop to feed the deer adequately. So my main exactly. focus is when I'm doing that is pH, N, P, and K. Those are the, the ones you really need to focus on. So, you know, that that is the reason why you want to pull the soil sample so you can know going into it exactly what you need to give those plants every opportunity to grow successfully. Okay. So, so, so far we've got pulling the sample. Mm-hmm what it is and what it tells you now. All right. Let's say you have the information of, of the sample. You, you put whatever it is that is needed in the soil, right? Whether, whether it's lime or you need some more nitrogen or whatever the case is right now, let's say you spread that in the ground. Now, now what are, what are the next steps? Or is it finding out what you want to plant or need to plant? Is it how much? I mean, what are you what are you doing now? Well, one thing that I meant to note is when you pull your soil sample, you have this form that you fill out that says what crop you want to grow. So you can write in there like clover or corn or soybeans or whatever, and it'll be a recommendation for whatever you're trying to grow. Because obviously corn needs a whole lot more nitrogen than soybeans do because soybeans are legumes, right? So they fix nitrogen to their soil or fix it to their roots and then it goes into the soil. So they can supply their own. So it's all based on the specific plant you're trying to grow, the specific crop you're trying to grow. Um, So with that being said, you know, that's that's really where we dive into that is you want to be specific. You know, because each plant that or each seed that you're going to plant takes different requirements. So you don't want to pull a corn sample and then plant clover in there because it's going to be way off, way off. And same with soybeans mm-hmm. and like gotcha. cow peas and stuff like that. It's just not the same. So you have to break it down into individual categories, right? So, you know, like for example, clover. You know, one thing about clover is that it's a legume too and you know it has a lot of amazing properties but as far as fertilizer recommendations go you know you're gonna want to i just totally messed up all right i'm gonna cut it right here and start over as far as clover goes you're gonna want to stick to the more of uh, you know zero 2020 fertilizer which is zero nitrogen because they don't need nitrogen and that applies for soybeans as well because you do not necessarily need nitrogen but you need the n or the p and the k for the actual plants to do what they need to do okay i got you no that totally makes sense so it's really just understanding what what you need for what you're planting and to get that understanding that's where the soil sample comes into play exactly that that's it 110 percent. there's a bunch of you know scientific stuff to go through but that is exactly right what you just said so okay now let's now so we're talking about summer plots let's talk about you just mentioned clover yeah. and you mentioned soybeans cow peas mm-hmm. um why why would a deer hunter want to plant uh like clover for example I know for me, it's just, just for me personally, I know that deer, deer really like it. And I know that I've had success over a clover plot and that's why I would plant it. Now I want to hear your kind of more scientific and in, in, in depth reason other than I plant it and the deer eat it. What, why do they eat it? Okay. So one of the things to look at with clover, there's many, okay. There's a lot of different aspects to clover that make it phenomenal so first and foremost it's very high in protein right and you know it's very palatable and what do i mean by palatable is when it's consumed 
it's it's easy to eat it i guess it tastes good i don't know i've never tried clover but it also has and more red clover specific but they all have these characteristics but we're speaking you know kind of in generalities right here um you know you've got calcium phosphorus potassium mag magnesium and a bunch of other minerals that go into these plants so not only are you getting the protein that you need but you're also getting all the other macro and micro nutrients that those deer need you know aside from the mineral stations that you have out too so they're getting a lot from clover and like i said it's super palatable it's very digestible and we'll get into the digestion rate and all that later but um as far as you know what it does for the deer it's phenomenal for total health because and another tip let me just back up real quick another thing is and you've seen this if you get your stand solid you don't have to plant it for five years you can just mm -hmm. go in and bush hog it and call it good you know that is that's one of those things that's a perennial so it can come back and come back and you know that all depends on the variety too right because you have perennial and annual clovers so if you're wanting to have a clover plot that's there for the next five years plant the perennial now clover can be kind of difficult to get established but once you get it established oh man that is a rock star of a food plot and another thing is you know aside from just deer I mean, turkey love it too. You know, turkeys will absolutely oh, hammer yeah. a clover plot. So, you know, that's kind of what I would say on the, the clover side of things is that, you know, high in protein, which obviously is what they need this at all times of the year, right? So it's not just spring mm -hmm. and summer. It's all the time. And that's the good thing about clover is it's there all the time. You know, it's not seasonal really. You know, and that's that's one of the right. good – that's why I, I rank clover number one is because it's not seasonal. So if you're, you know, trying to establish something that's going to work for a long time and be constant year-round, that's where you go to is your clover because you don't have to plant it summer, fall, yeah. back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's just there. Well, and the other great thing about it is the browse pressure, it can take a lot of a, – a lot so you know mm -hmm. if you get a soybean field and you get 30 deer in there they can wipe it out pretty darn quick whereas a clover field not not so much i mean you can mow a daggum clover field and it'll be mm -hmm. back i mean everybody has clover in their in their yard probably i mean it's the same yeah. same kind of idea so so the browse pressure is, is really high yeah no that's a great point that you bring up uh you know a lot of these crops that you plant are, are not browse pressure tolerant, right? So let's talk about soybeans for a minute and we're going to correlate these two. So yeah. soybeans, if you have like a quarter of an acre of soybeans and a quarter of an acre of clover, the soybeans are going to be gone in a week. The clover is going to be there for the next five years. For years. And, and yeah. it doesn't matter how much those deer eat it. It's still going to keep coming. It's just going to keep coming back, keep coming back. And, you know, the thing about the soybeans is, is that they're just gone. Like, there is no coming back. They're just gone. When they start nipping them leaves off, it's over. They don't come back from it. And, you know, right. although it provides a lot of high protein and all that stuff, we'll get into that more in a minute, but. It, it it provides a lot of the same stuff that clover does, but it doesn't have the lifespan of clover. And it takes a larger right. acreage to plant to have the same effect as clover in a smaller area. I got you. Well, let's, let's dive into soybeans for just a second. You al almost did. Let's just do it. So, I mean, soybeans, the biggest difference, right, is, is the protein, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so so soy, it, it has yeah. the highest protein, right? Yep, yep. So soybeans are going to have about thirty five percent protein, which is um, very very good. I mean, that's what you want in, in this time of the year. And here's why: you're wanting to provide the most protein possible because not only are you trying to grow, you know, the bucks and all that stuff, which is what they need for muscular growth and things of that nature, but 
you know, you're also trying to give those mamas enough um, muscle growth, milk production. And there's a lot of things in, in both clover and soybeans, but soybeans specifically, you know, they have a lot of the same stuff that uh, the nutrients, but in a different form, like vitamin C, vitamin B6. You know, so it's a totally, it's really different in what they offer because, you know, clover is not offering the B6, the iron, the vitamin C, things like that. So you're really diversifying a lot when you have more than just clover or more than just soybeans. You're getting a lot of both worlds that intermingle together to generate the best situation possible for those deer. Okay. I mean, yeah, that definitely makes all the sense in the world. Um, and I mean, what are you, what are you trying to, to, to plant? So what I'm trying to ask is how big would you recommend planting soybeans to where it becomes reasonable to plant them? Because just like you said, if you plant a little plot, it gets eaten really fast. And then, I mean, the deer aren't really there eating them come season. So when, when does it become a big enough food plot of soybeans for it to be worth your while to hunt. Well, I'm going to take a step back real quick because I forgot a very important fact about soybeans is that they are super high in fat and fat storage is almost essential to make it through the winter mm -hmm. and through the rut season or the breeding season, whatever you want to call it. You have to have the fat to make it through. In fact, you know, I've seen deer die because they couldn't handle the cold and the, the pressure and the stress of the rut. You know, their bodies just absolutely couldn't handle it because they didn't have those fat storages built up that could handle the pressure and handle, you know, everything that was going against them. You know, because when they're out there running, chasing those does, they're burning every ounce. They're burning through stuff all the time. So if you go ahead and start building that fat storage now, then you already have a reserve built up. So that just helps. Even the does, man. I mean, the does are getting chased around all over the country, you know, all over God's creation. Those does are getting hammered by these bucks. So not only is it important for your bucks, but it's also important for your does as well to have the, uh, the fat storage built up. And, you know, the fat storage helps with milk production too. So, um, that's that's one thing right. I wanted to to say about that, and uh, you know I think that's a a very good point to note. So as far as like the field size, um, I've always gone by the rule of five acres, uh, because five acres gives you enough beans in the ground to actually survive. I mean you're going to lose a lot really fast, and you know. But last year I planted two or one five acre field to be exact of soybeans and they couldn't quite eat all mm -hmm. of it they they just couldn't quite get in there and eat all of it so now they ate a lot of it i mean they they hammered a lot of that field but it gave the field enough time to grow and to get up right. to a stage that was you know su sustainable during this browse pressure you know because they clip them off I want to say it's below the cotyledon sleeves. I know cotyledon is in cotton, but I think it's the same for soybeans. But if they clip them off right when they first come up, done. Game over. Those are dead. But if they yeah. if, if the plant has time to come on up and get some foliage on it, then it can be browsed. And it's, you know, there's so many plants, you know, going into that five acres that there's enough for them to eat to where they won't eat all of it unless you just have like an astronomical amount mm -hmm. of whitetail and even then you know that's just kind of my rule is five acres uh as a minimum for soybean fields so that way you know, like i said you, you have enough for them to eat all summer long now let me ask you this because i've seen this roaming around on the internet for a hot minute is some people put like like a almost like a fence around maybe maybe a couple posts and a couple strings or something or mm -hmm. electric or whatever it is i don't know but they essentially they kind of fence off their food plot and more more specifically stuff like cow peas or or soybeans 
Uh, have you ever done that? Have, do, do you know people that do that? Do you find that effective? Have you ever kind of dove in that world? Yeah, so, I mean, it can be very effective, but you also have to remember that a deer can jump an eight-foot fence like it's nothing. If they want in there bad enough, they're going to get in there, you know. Um, but it does help. You know, they're going to go up and they'll either get shocked or, or realize, hey, there's something going on here that I don't need to mess with you know, and they'll back off Mm -hmm. and and it does have its, its purpose. It really does. Um, but I I don't know that it's cost effective to do it on a five acre plot. I would say you may want to focus on that on your smaller plots, like your quarter acre, half an acre, something like that. Not, I wouldn't dive into that on your bigger plots because it's just going to get costly and a lot of time spent putting up the post to go around five acres yeah. is a lot. But it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but as far as, you know, just a little plot and trying to get it yeah. established, yeah. that that may be a way to go mm-hmm. potentially yeah. for somebody. Yeah, I mean, it could absolutely help a lot. I mean, you know, if you can keep, you know, I mean, like I said, you're not going to keep every deer out of there, but if you can keep the whole 10 of them from getting in there, then your plot has a lot right. better chance for success. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've just, I've, I've never really dove kind of, dove into that world or or looked into it i've just i don't know i've just never done it but Mm -hmm. i'm i'm sure you have definitely seen it in in your day oh yeah yeah we have we have tried it we've tried a little bit of everything to make food plots work you know us old rednecks (laughs) we'll get out there and and get a little wild with stuff like well uh you know i i thought of this idea i was reading on the internet and you know because i couldn't figure out well how am i gonna get my dang soybeans to grow and then i I researched and it said, well, you can just put hot sauce in your spray tank when you're applying your herbicide and it'll stick to the leaves and it'll be not tasty until the next rain. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if it's not going to rain for two or three weeks, well, guess what? Your plot's not going to get touched for two or three weeks. Now, I don't know if that really works. Never tried it, but I thought about it. Thought about it more than once. (laughs) You know, I thought, man... How many packs of hot sauce do I need to make this work that it's not going to like taint my, what I'm trying to do with the, the herbicide here, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh man. What, what does that look like? It may just kill, kill the plant. I I don't know. I don't know. I ain't no telling. So I'd rather not kill all my soybeans. So. Oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I kind of touched on it there. Cow peas. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I've been told it's very similar to to a soybean. Is that is there any truth to that? Yeah, there is. So, um, your your cow peas are going to have more. So it's the same high high protein as soybeans and clover. They're all three very high protein producers. The difference is is that when the peas actually go into the pod stage and they actually develop the seed, that is excellent food source for not only deer but turkeys quail and a bunch of other birds of that nature and another thing to note about the cow peas is that it's full of vitamin b9 copper vitamin b1 and you know it's got manganese and iron too so it's a lot like the the soybeans but uh the the cool thing about cow peas too is it has 11 percent dietary fiber which is, is pretty nice, you know. Um, so I'll get into the dietary fiber in a little bit. and But it's a really good thing. It is a really good thing to have for those deer. So it's a little bit different, you know, but still pretty close to the same. That's why I choose these three for your spring and summer plots is because they all three have a lot to offer uh, for your deer. And it's good to diversify, right. you know. So if you're diversifying – Let's say you have four, three or four food plots. Let's just say three for the, for the sake of having three varieties here. So just put one in each food plot and then you've got all your bases covered Mm -hmm. and you're providing an astronomical amount of protein throughout your whole farm. Or you could just run with straight clover, you know, and then have your mineral sites too. I mean, that's one thing you got to think too, is your, uh, your mineral sites are also providing a lot of these things too. So, you know, we're giving them every opportunity to grow 
to their full potential, does included. I'm not just talking about mature bucks. I'm talking about your does, your babies. They all need the total nutrition package. Mm-hmm. So you talk about planting, planting the food plots. Mm-hmm. Is there a certain time that we need to get clover in the ground versus soybeans versus cow peas? Are they all kind of the same time frame? When, when do we need to be putting this stuff in, in the dirt? Well, clover, you know, is, is pretty resilient once you get it planted. You know, a really good time to plant clover is when it frosts, you can frost seed it. So basically what you're doing is when the ground frosts, you know, it will, I don't even know how to explain it, but you pretty much you broadcast your seed over top. And then when it thaws, it all, it brings the seed into the soil. So that frozen soil will then open up and your, your seed will be within the soil, which is what you want anyway. So that's a great way to do it. Um, another way is to use a grain drill. Um, now the seeding rate is going to be totally different and soybeans are generally wanting to get in the ground around the 1st of May, maybe the end of April, depending on the frost and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's just a generality, you know, you can plant and that it also depends on your location. So, you know, the Southern States, you can plant, you know, a little earlier sometimes than the Northern States, because up there you're uh, constantly you know worried about a freeze or something like that but also up there they have a whole different variety of bean that is suitable for those conditions so you know it really just depends on your region when you're wanting to get them in the ground and how soon you know you can feasibly plant them without harming the plant due to freeze and, and you know like i said variety which variety are you planting you know but mm-hmm. but typically speaking in our region may through the first right. part of june may through june is kind of your uh window there um i would suggest may right um i mean clover i'm sure it has a specific plant date but i mean man i just kind of plant clover whenever i feel like it and it's always done pretty good you yeah. know it's not like uh Same. yeah i mean i've never really had oh well i got to go by this specific guideline for clover i'm just like well let's grab some fertilize yeah. and go spread it out and call her good. You know, <laughs> I mean, we'll just call it good yeah, and, exactly. and, and just move on. Um, so. Well, yeah. And same here because I, I you know, to me, I usually just kind of plant my stuff in June mm-hmm. and it just tends to work out because, you know, I, I Turkey hunt, you know, Turkey hunting in, ends in May. Then I kind of give myself a week or so, and then we're kind of in, in the first part of June. And then I start my process of whatever it is, whether I need to mow or, you know, spray or till up the dirt or whatever. Then by, by the first week, two weeks max of June, I got everything planted and fertilized and mm-hmm. all that fun jazz. Oh yeah. And you know, the weather has a huge factor in that too, right? So I've been trying to plant soybeans for the past four weeks and we have had rain after rain after rain after rain after rain there was one week that it was five days straight there ain't no way you're getting in a plowed field with five days straight of rain in fact there was one specific time in that period where we got 10 inches of rain overnight and let me just tell you something that is Mm. where you get your tractor stuck to the axles and you got to have a big boy to yank it out or a big tow truck to yank it out. And where I'm at down there, you know what it's like. There's no cell service and it's a long yeah. walk back to the lodge. So I try to avoid good luck getting stuck at all costs, you know? And plus, man, you know, I don't want to destroy uh, yeah. the, the ground and all that stuff, leaving big ruts. Well, then I got to go disc it again and, you know, make it look right. So, you know, weather really depends on your planting date really depends on weather. You know, you can set a planting date all you want to, but if that ground is yeah. too dry, too too moist, you know, it's hard to, I mean, it's hard to, to turn a field. It's like asphalt. You know, me and you tried that, what was it, two years ago? We tried planting beans and yeah, we were luck. doing the, the no-till and the planter wouldn't even go into the soil. It was just over. It just wasn't doing it. And that's when I learned, uh, I mean, I already knew about, you know, soil types and all that, but when, when I 
physically experienced soul that hard. I was mm. like, holy smokes, man, I need to get in here and turn this ground. And, you know, I knew that in the back of my head, but I was just rushing, trying to get some, you know, stuff in the ground. And let me tell you something. Yeah, exactly. Rushing farming never works, ever. It's never going to pan out. You have to do the steps and do them in the right order. And if you're not doing that, then you're just wasting a whole heck of a lot of time. This stuff's going to break or yep. it's not going to plain break. and simple there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and you so, know, and one thing I'm going to add to that real quick is, you know, uh, yeah. when we're talking about these small food plots, you don't have to have a hundred horsepower tractor to get in there and do this stuff. You know, you can use a, a 30 horse or you can use a hand tiller. I have done both. I mean, hand tillers work great. You know, all you're trying to do is give those seed, the best soil contact possible. That's the goal. It doesn't matter how you get there, whether it's a hand tiller or a tractor, it does not matter. What matters is, is you're preparing the best possible seed bed. That's what matters. And either way is going to do it. It's just how much time are you going to put into it to get it to that point? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, what are you willing to do to get out of it? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of just life in general. You know, you, you oh, get yeah. in whatever, or you, or you get out whatever you put into it. So yeah, that's just, that's just the way life rolls. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, you know, part of it. So I kind of want to switch gears here to fertilizer. We've mm -hmm. kind of been talking about it. Uh, you kind of mentioned it with the, with the clover and things, how it didn't need the, the nitrogen per se. Mm -hmm. um so i just want to talk about kind of what is fertilizer and how would you use it on these three th on these three different plots that we're talking about for the summertime okay so fertilizer is simply plant food simply put that's what it is so the plants are consuming these nutrients in the soil to grow and like i've noted before it's npk the nitrogen phosphorus potassium those are your majors, like your three main ones that you need to focus on. And now, cowpeas are different. They're not like clover and soybeans. They don't produce their own nitrogen. So, you know, your your soybeans are, yeah. I mean, to get a yield of 30 bushels an acre, right, you're going to need about 25 pounds of phosphate, and about 40-ish pounds of potash per acre, and that's going to get you around your 30 bushel an acre yield. Now, granted, if you're trying to do this commercially, obviously you want your yield to be as high as it can be um, because you're trying to harvest it and bring in money for that, right? Um, but you can also use the same method as clover, just leave off the nitrogen and run 2020, and apply that at whatever rate the soil sample recommends um to get what you need to get out of it because like i said you're not trying to produce a huge 80 bushel an acre yield you're not trying to do that you're trying to produce tonnage the leaves that's what the deer are eating now will they eat the beans once mm -hmm. they're developed yes they will but it's not mm -hmm. the same nutrition or nutritional value as Mm -hmm. the leaves themselves it's a lot less so the leaves are where all your nutrition comes from on the beans now when you dive into cowpeas now it depends on what fertilizer you're using so if you're using triple 19 you're going to want to use about 200 pounds per acre and if you're using triple 13 you're going to want to bump that up a little bit to about 250 pounds an acre because you know give or take a little bit back and forth but you know, they just require a lot different than uh, right. clover and, and soybeans, soybeans. And all that. but it's still, it's all dependent on that soil sample because you may not have to put out 200 pounds. You know, you may not have to put out 250 pounds. You may only have to put out 100 pounds. That's the thing. That's the whole importance of the soil sample is knowing exactly what you need because there's no sense yeah. in going out and spending a whole lot of money on fertilizer that you don't need because what you're going to do is if you build it up too much, 
the plants can't handle it. So it has to be that, right? Yeah. Well, that's more with nitrogen stuff, but, um, but it's still more than, than they need. And it's too much. You want that perfect balance of exactly what it needs to perform the best because too much, too little, bad, perfect balance. Beautiful. So, you know, that's, that's what I I would, I would suggest on, on that, you know, is, um, given the plants everything they need. And that's why it's so important to pull the soil sample. So, you know, exactly what you're getting into. Cause I mean, let's face it, you know, if you could save 150 bucks on fertilizer, well, that's another tree stand. Yeah. Well, that's another wise eye trail camera, you know, or whatever, you know, you want to allocate right. that money to, I mean, diesel fuel, whatever, you know, that's that. And two, you know, you're not overdoing it. You know, you want to have that good balance. So to me, it just sounds like, Someone needs to go to like the local co-op, bring them the soil sample, and then just let those people, the professionals, tell you. Or they could go to school and figure out how to how to read it. But if they're like me, I just tell my buddy with an agronomy, you know, degree or whatever it is, or and then I just go here. Tell me, just freaking tell me what I need. I don't I don't want to understand it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, man. I mean, there there's a whole lot of things that go into, you know the soil science and the agronomy side of things that it's just really helpful. You know, I mean, the beautiful thing is, is I get to use my degree every single day. You know, I didn't waste a bunch of time on something I don't ever get to use, which is huge, huge for me. And, you know, as I think too, as we go along, we're going to dive into some more varieties for the fall plots and stuff Mm -hmm. like that too. And, um, you know, I just think that would be something Uh, that would be good in the future because you know those deer need that stuff in in the fall too so you know we want to do the the total 365 plan for your critters all right so now we've now that we've covered the fertilizer now there we're going to talk about what comes after this why are we doing all of this work and that's deer nutrition we've been talking about it this whole time once you do all the work, now it's time for the deer's part of the bargain. What do they get to do? How does it help them? What goes into all of that? But we're going to make you wait one more week. And we're going to talk about that on next week's episode. So please look forward to that. Make sure you guys tune in. So this week we went over a soil sample, what it is, how to do it, what it tells you. We went over clover soybeans cow peas we went over fertilizer and now next week we'll go over what it does for the deer ben you got anything else buddy oh man just get ready hold on because we're about to deep dive into the lives of a ruminant which is the four chambers of one stomach i'll tell you more about that next week in the meantime though don't forget for all things rooted television and rooted podcasts Go to rootedtelevision.com. All of our episodes are there. We're on all main streaming platforms for this beautiful podcast that we have. And we have merch. Go shop. Go buy a hoodie. Go buy a hat, a t-shirt, whatever. And if you really want to support this show and keep us going with what we're doing, there is a link in our description that you can do so. With that, John, the redneck is out. See ya. For all things Rooted Podcast and Rooted Television, and I mean hats, shirts, hoodies, and other merch, check out our friends at CH Lone Star Pro and the link that is in our description.